Hey guys, I wanted to do a quick video talking about the DDR pad that I built with FSRs. How I built it, some of the challenges I went through, and uh, how it came out. Now I actually planned on recording like real videos of me building this thing. As you'll see, I ended up spending so much time on it, I had to kind of drop that. So this video is actually going to be more of like a slideshow. So overall, this is a DDR pad. I took all the guts out of it, so it's no longer using arcade sensors, there's no pad I.O., there's no existing wiring loom, all that's been ripped out. Instead, it's using FSR sensors, which uh, is a force sensing resistor. It's a lot newer technology than your standard arcade sensor. It has uh, LEDs uh, that light up when you press the buttons, and it also has some accent lights that I can turn on and off with a button that's on the side. It's all held together with Sujit's software, which is really nice. It has a, a nice UI where you can select sensor thresholds. And of course, that also includes the firmware, which also comes from Sujit's repository. So, why did I do this? Well, I already have an ITG Dedicab, and as far as I'm concerned, that's kind of like the Cadillac of ITG experiences. But I wanted to experiment with FSRs. I wanted to try them out, see what it's all about. I also wanted an ITG experience on an HD screen without, you know, hacking up my Dedicab and putting a giant monitor, you know, mounting it on the front. So this kind of seemed like a good opportunity to get into that. I also wanted to not have to rely on my Dedicab running to actually play the game. It is really stressful owning a Dedicab or really any arcade game, but especially one where they're not making parts for it anymore. I forget where I heard this, but the concept of you can own certain things, and then you have some things like a racehorse, which kind of owns you. And that's kind of how I feel with the Deddy Cab, is that, you know, it's owning one of these is a huge responsibility, and it's just like a constant headache and stress, just worrying that my monitor is going to explode someday. So the thought of having a, a pad I could just plug into a computer, uh, just a standard computer that's going to like have an HD version of Stepmania at my fingertips sounds really appealing. So at its core, that's kind of why I'm doing this. So the first step was actually buying a DDR machine. I was actually in the market for DDR pads or a DDR machine for a long time. I've wanted to do this for a while, but I couldn't find many sellers in my area. I was actually out traveling and someone posted about an auction the town over from mine where two DDR machines sold for about $1,200 each. Now you have to add on a couple hundred bucks more for fees and taxes, but I was really bummed I missed these cabinets. So that night I just called around some local arcades near me and the third one told me that they had a DDR machine that they would just sell to me directly. I ended up buying it for cheaper than the auction machines had sold for especially when you consider those fees and the taxes. Picking it up was complicated by the fact that I injured my ankle a few days before, but with the help of some friends and my pickup truck, we were able to retrieve it. I ended up keeping one pad. Uh, I sold the actual cabinet and some of the other parts, and the other pad went to Sidro, who was another stamina player. So then it was time to actually build the pads. I started by disassembling the pads and cleaning out all of the coom. They were pretty gross and I didn't want to constantly be getting my hands uh, all dirty as I worked on them. So everything was cleaned off uh, once it was removed from the pad and then it was mostly just put back together again. While cleaning I noticed that some of the leg levelers were pretty beat up so I ordered some new uh, replacements. I also ordered some uh, replacement panels that were just clear pieces of polycarbonate because I wanted to have clear panels to show the lights through. So I got everything cleaned and separated and then I actually put it all back together except for the parts that I just wanted out of the way which um, were like all the arcade wiring and sensors which all just went into a bin. The electronics parts that I had been ordering they kind of like trickled in so as they were arriving I was like working on prototyping stuff out. Now I I'm really not like an electronics guy. I know very little about electronics or electricity in general but I have read the guides that some people like Sereni have put together and uh, I can at least follow those. The real unknown for me was the lights. There's a lot of guides about how to do FSRs with Arduinos and that's like pretty well known but nobody really has like a guide that you can reference about lights. So for me that was kind of the tricky part. 
Now I ended up going with uh, a Teensy, which is kind of like a spin-off of an Arduino that's like a little bit more powerful. But when people are talking about Teensies and Arduinos, like most cases, they're kind of like cross compatible, the code that you write for one or the other. Uh, in fact, you, you use the Arduino IDE when writing code for the Teensy. So I j simply just got it because it was more powerful and I thought that would be better in the long run. It's also more expensive and I ended up blowing one up. So maybe an Arduino would have been a better choice. So I got my Teensy, I got a breadboard, and I got my FSRs in from Interlink and I wired them up according to the diagram that I saw in Sereni's guide and using Sujit's firmware uh, I was able to press and hold the sensor and pull up the serial monitor in the Arduino IDE inside there I could press V and hit enter and that V command would show the values of the current sensors so holding down the FSRs if I sent the V command I could see one of the sensors uh, values would jump up and at that point I knew the FSRs were working. Lights were another story. I went with a really simple way of implementing lights and it's it's just not the best way but it is simple so it's easy for you to do if you want to try to replicate this but there there just are better ways of doing it like there are things like called fast LED is one and uh, NeoPixels another and I'm just too smooth brain to figure out how to use them so there are a couple drawbacks with the way that I implemented them. The first of which is that RGB is not really supported and it's kind of tricky to do with my method. If you do have RGB lights, you can pick one of the colors, like you could pick green or blue, but you can't really cycle between them using the Arduino. It's also not the most space efficient solution. You know, for, for what it's doing, it takes up a lot of like space and there's a lot of wires being run here. So for four lights, it works okay, but if you had any more or if you wanted RGB, you really wouldn't want to go with this method. But on the positive side, it is very cheap and it is very easy. So the solution I went with was using a MOSFET. And I followed some tutorials uh, for controlling LED strips with an Arduino with MOSFETs. I found I could buy pre-made MOSFET modules that made them a lot easier to use. I think I got a pack of 10 of them for like 10 bucks off of Amazon. Again, I'm not an electrical engineer and I don't even know the right terms and I'm a little too lazy to even like Google them. So I'm just going to explain it like I would explain it to like a five year old how this is working. But the gist of it is you need a 12 volt power supply or, or 12 volts or higher for like any like decently bright LEDs. The, the Teensy doesn't output 12 volts. Therefore, you need a 12 volt power supply to supply the power to the LEDs. I ended up getting mine off of Amazon for like 15 bucks, but it's way overpowered for my use case. You could probably get a much cheaper one. Now, we can wire these LEDs directly to the output of the power supply. And indeed, that's what I do for some of my accent lights. But if you want to control when the light turns on or off or fades in and out, then we need the Teensy to control it somehow. But again, the Teensy can't touch anything 12 volts. Ask me how I know. But the Teensy can talk to the MOSFET module using 3 volts or 5 volts. The MOSFET can send the power to the light when the Teensy tells it to. The Teensy sends an analog signal to the MOSFET and the greater the signal, the more power the MOSFET will send to the light. Without getting too technical, if you analog write a value of zero to the MOSFET, the MOSFET will not send any power to the light. If you set analog write to like 50, it will turn on dimly. And finally, analog write 255 turns it on full blast. Once I had this prototyped on my desk, I knew implementing lights was going to be easy. Now this is the point in the project where what would be a small project ended up ballooning into something huge. If you're going to replicate this, I'd recommend you really think on if this is going to be the way you go. I was concerned about my pad having offset L brackets. What I mean by that is that the L brackets are actually offset a little bit on every side of the panel. Unlike a Dedicab, I guess a lot of DDR pads are like this. I wasn't sure I could have equal sensitivity along the edge of the panel if the, the brackets were offset to one side and I had a sensor on the brackets. 
Additionally, I was hoping to remove the arcade sensors as they wouldn't be used, but doing so would lower the resting height of the L brackets because the L brackets normally sit on the, the arcade sensor. And I was concerned about getting the panels level if I was kind of raising the L bracket to a random height and then tightening it down. I knew some other people like Nitties had 3D printed some risers which allowed them to place the sensors either dead in the middle or put one on each side and have two sensors in each panel. While this seems to work very well, it also has the sensor and its connector and wires sticking out through the center of the panel, the panel where I was trying to have lights. So since I had a clear panel, I really didn't want an ugly shadow on every single panel. So I came up with a plan of fabricating some plastic strips which would act as risers to essentially raise the existing panel frame up. I didn't have access or skills to use a 3D printer, so I thought I could buy some plastic sheets and cut and stack several layers. I could even have some different thicknesses of plastic so I could mix and match and get the panel to the perfect height. This would allow me to use a long 200mm FSR which would have the wiring go off to the side into the corner of the panel which gave me sensitivity along the entire edge of the panel and then would also look great for lights. And I only had to worry about a total of four sensors unlike some other implementations that have two sensors per panel. By the way, one downside to the longer 200mm FSRs is they're only sold with solder tabs, so you need to do some soldering if you want to use them. I quickly learned that plastic sheeting is pretty expensive, especially in COVID times. But luckily I found some dude on Craigslist who sold me four very large sheets of plastic in all different thicknesses for a total of 20 bucks. So I got cutting. I used the wrong tool for the job at first. Eventually my neighbor helped me rip the plastic sheets using his table saw. Once I had them in strips, I could further make cuts using only a razor blade. I would make a cut to score the plastic on one side, then bending it would cause it to snap right at that line. For more precise cuts, I'd use some pliers to bend the plastic. Eventually I landed on this shape. I spent hours making these over and over, trying my best not to cut myself in the process. Once I had enough, I could stack them, drill holes, countersink the top layer, and screw them down into the frames. I now had a completely flat surface to mount the FSRs onto, and I can adjust it easily by unscrewing the stack. I knew I wanted to use the 200mm FSR, but I wasn't sure exactly how to hold them down. I knew I could have taped them down or used double-sided tape, but my adjustable plastic spacers had screws that needed to be undone, which was completely blocked by the sensor. After a bit of thinking, I remember Matt Magnan telling us that he used Velcro for securing his FSRs and it worked very well. I thought I could put Velcro down on top of the topmost plastic layer and cut some holes to access the countersunk screws. The fuzzy side of the Velcro could get attached to the FSR itself. I could carefully remove the Velcroed FSR if I needed to access those screws. So I bought some knockoff Velcro called Hook and Loop Tape off of Amazon for about 10 bucks. The FSR was much more thin than the one inch thick Velcro tape I purchased, so when attached to the FSR, a lot of the sticky side was still exposed. So I ended up putting a piece of Gorilla Tape on the other side, sandwiching the FSR in between the Velcro and tape. I could then carefully cut off the excess from around the FSR, leaving me with a homemade removable sensor. Once I had the sensors in and the lights mounted, I just had to wire them up. I could have just reused the existing wiring loom from the DDR pad, but some part of me thought it would be cool to hang on to the original guts of the pad, knowing that I could just slap in the arcade sensors anytime I wanted, so I decided to make my own wires. I used silicone wire. I had heard someone in the past rant and rave about how silicone wire was so much nicer than PVC, but I didn't think much of it. I just bought it because I thought it would be better, but I'm very glad I went with it. It's so much more flexible and easy to route, especially on the ends where things need to plug into the breadboard. I wanted to make clean connectors that were easy to replace. After a bit of research, I went with DuPont connectors. I had to buy a tool and learn how to use them, and the insulation on the silicone wire was a little too thick for them to fit in the housing properly. So I had to slice a tiny bit of the insulation off of each of the edges of the wire. But once I got the hang of it, making connectors was easy. I wired connectors onto the ends of the LEDs and the FSRs. The MOSFET module had pins which fit nicely into a 3x1 DuPont connector. 
I also decided, along with the panel lights, to have a bright underglow, similar to SMX pads. I also wanted some accent lights inside each panel, so there was some color there even when the button wasn't pressed. Again, my method of lights doesn't support RGB, so I went with a white LED strip. I kind of regret cheaping out there. If I was doing this again, I would have installed an RGBW strip and just wired up the white. That way, it would be easy for me to upgrade to RGB later down the line if I wanted to. Finally, I wired up a button to control the accent lights. I had the player 2 pad, so I had a single hole in the frame on the left side. I made a plastic panel to cover this hole, which was the perfect spot to mount the button. So this work I did to make the frame risers ended up taking a substantial amount of time. Was it a waste of time? Maybe? Yes. I think if I was guiding someone on building a pad, I would definitely steer them in the direction of just putting the FSRs on top of the existing L brackets. It's so much simpler, and I think this project would have taken one-tenth of the time. But I like the solution I landed on, even if it was time-consuming and a bit unconventional. I'm happy with it. I think Ryan Stetson will be proud. Once the pad was together, I could finally get the software together to see it in use. I looked through all of the available resources I could find for FSR pads. There are a lot of options out there, and each project has different unique features. I tried to set up three or four of them, and the one I stuck with was Sujit's. Sujit's firmware comes with light support. He has it coded up so that whatever pin you're reading the sensor value from, he's sending a signal out to the corresponding digital pin plus two. So if you have a sensor on A0, the light signal comes out on digital pin 2 when the sensor fires. But not only does he have great firmware, he has a complete UI that allows you to see real-time values, set thresholds, and saves your settings for next time. Best of all, it's pretty easy to get set up too. You just have to install Python and Node. Once Python and Node were installed, I just had to tweak a file to use the correct serial port. I also had to reorder the sensors so that they showed up in the right order in the UI. And then I had the UI up and running. I can tweak sensor thresholds on my browser or from my cell phone. He even has a visualization that shows sensor data over time. Very handy. And that's it. I have an FSR pad now. I'm still working out some bugs and I'm trying to get it as close to the feel of my Dedicab. I'm having an issue where it's a bit too sensitive and I'm running out of headroom on the UI to change the threshold. To remedy this, I'm planning on swapping out the 330 ohm resistors I have with a different value, which should change the sensitivity. I put my 32 inch LG 144 Hz monitor on a tall bar height table, slapped a PC underneath it with some speakers, and now I have a pretty cool little SM5 cabinet slash streaming station. I love my Dedicab. Playing on it is a lot of fun, and it's a unique experience, but man, it's so nice to finally have a setup I can just turn on, and within a few seconds, I have ITG running at a crisp, clean 2K resolution. Nothing in this closed loop system is troublesome to fix, unlike the Dedicab, where a hundred things could break that are literally irreplaceable. And it feels great. Anyways, thanks for watching, everybody. Hopefully, this video will help out a person or two in the future who is thinking about making a FSR pad out of a DDR pad. See ya!